Elric of Melnibone, Prologue This is the tale of Elric before he was called Woman Slayer, before the final collapse of Melnibone. This is the tale of his rivalry with his cousin Iracun, and his love for his cousin Cimmeril, before that rivalry and that love brought Imria, the dreaming city, crashing in flames, raped by the reavers from the young kingdoms. This is the tale of the two black swords, Stormbringer and Mornblade, and how they were discovered and what part they played in the destiny of Elric and Melnibone, a destiny which was to shape a larger destiny, that of the world itself. This is the tale of when Elric was a king, the commander of dragons, fleets, and all the folk of that half-human race which had ruled the world for 10,000 years. This is a tale of tragedy, this tale of Melnibone, the Dragon Isle. This is a tale of monstrous emotions and high ambitions. This is a tale of sorceries and treacheries and worthy ideals, of agonies and fearful pleasures, of bitter love and sweet hatred. This is the tale of Elric of Melnibone. Much of it Elric himself was to remember only in his nightmares. Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. Today we're going to discuss Michael Moorcock's eternal champion, Elric of Melnibone. Moorcock's fantasy protagonists all became facets of the eternal champion, a multiverse of flawed reluctant heroes. None were more famous than Elric of Melnibone. While some may not have heard of Elric, those who have have honored him in word, art, and song. This is a character and a series that has a strong, loyal fanship. If you've never read Elric of Melnibone, is it worth a read? Should you look for more of Michael Moorcock's Elric of Melnibone? I'll let you know my thoughts, but first, a confession. I am one of those science fiction fans that came to science fiction through media. The original Star Trek, The Twilight Zone, Space 1999. You may notice that all these TV shows are prior to Star Wars. I was 14 years old when Star Wars came out. When visiting bookshops, I eagerly went to the science fiction section. I couldn't understand why fantasy was there. I was looking for spaceships and battles, for clever heroes and interesting stories with twist endings. Soon, through my library at school, I started to explore more in SF. Pierre Boulle, Planet of the Apes. The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. I, Robot by Isaac Asimov. The Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke. And The Rolling Stones by Robert Heinlein. You may notice, though, I have not named a fantasy author. You may also notice that there's not a female author. As a teenager, I definitely had some blinders. Into my late teens and early 20s, I found more authors and more stories. Some bookstores started to separate fantasy and science fiction, and I would completely ignore the fantasy section. Then I got married and we had children. Although I watched science fiction and media, my reading was curtailed. And when I did read, I wanted to read something that I would call a popcorn read, and that often turned to mystery or thrillers. Don't get me wrong, I still did read some science fiction. But fantasy? Not on my radar. As my children grew, though, guess what they loved? They were of that generation that the Harry Potter books were coming out. Harry Potter books were a stepping stone, at least for my children, to Tolkien. Still, I had a reluctance in reading fantasy on my own. Work and family were my focus. 
Now that my children have moved out and married and I'm retired, I decided to return to my first love of science fiction. But as I started to read the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I discovered that fantasy was just naturally a part of science fiction in those days. As I decided to explore and read different publisher series, I started to get a good dose of fantasy, and I started to realize that there was much to appreciate. Just as my blinders for female authors left, and I have a number of favorite female authors, so too have my blinders for fantasy. Elric is my first read without having been part of a publisher's series, and it was good. Elric is the last emperor of the island civilization of Mel Nibone. He is tall and lean, his flesh the color of a bleached skull. His long hair flows below his shoulders and is milk white. His eyes crimson and moody. Physically weak, Elric must use special herbs to maintain his health and vitality. From childhood, he read freely in the immense royal library and learned of the world outside the Dreaming Isle. Perhaps due to this study, unlike other members of his race, Elric has a conscience. He observes the decadence of his own culture, which once ruled the known world, and worries about the rise of the young kingdoms populated by humans. Elric is full of introspective self-loathing, and hatred of Mel Nibonean traditions. His subjects find him odd and unfathomable. His cousin Erkun is next in line and interprets Elric's behavior as weakness. He plots his overthrow. This is a dramatic tale of betrayal, death, and rebirth. What alliances does Elric make which will affect the future of the known world? Will he be able to regain his kingdom? What role do two magic swords play in this outcome? And at what price does one possess a sword? Or does the sword possess him? This is legendary storytelling. Michael Moorcock magically weaves story after story, giving depth to not only Mel Nibone, but also to the multi-universe and the eternal champion. This is my starting point in this story. Elric seemed to be the anti-hero, the anti-Conan. He is self-loathing and weak, too trustworthy, and ultimately a young man bullied by the expectations placed on him by his people and by his cousin Erkun. This was a very satisfying beginning to what is a long story. I do plan to read on in this saga. I give Elric of Mel Nibone 9 out of 10. Recommended. So I'm curious, is there anyone else who would like to admit blinders that they had as a young reader? What do you think of the anti-hero Elric? Which are some of the best stories of Elric? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, keep reading.